Tonight, my investigation into the country's gang underworld continues, including some alarming information about the Asian control over our country's drug supply. Last week's program looked at the past and the present for the gangs. This week, we look at the future, what lies ahead for the gangs, what lies ahead for us. The large powerful gangs are rapidly evolving into highly organised, ruthless and secretive organisations and under them a pool of young men imitating the gangster life, aspiring to a life of violence and crime. To appreciate how sophisticated and dangerous the gangs are becoming, it's important to see where they've come from. We're all trying to break into the gangs because it was a new and emerging network of criminal activity out there that we didn't really fully understand from the police side of it, so the only real way was to get in there and do it. Evan ran a group of undercover cops inside the gangs in the mid to late 70s. One of his most successful operators infiltrated the Highway 61 gang. I always remember the, the tale of him. He told us one of his first few nights in the headquarters there where a dead rat got brought in and thrown on the pool table. And he, he realised straight away what was going to happen and thought, oh, best to be in first. So he grabbed the rat and chewed the tail and threw it back and left it. And that was his part done. He didn't have to partake any further in the destruction of this rat. What? To eat it? Yeah. Yeah, see, I wouldn't have immediately thought that. Evan gave up undercover work in the 80s and left the police soon after, but he's still got his ear to the ground. I sit here today and I've a fair idea of what's happening out there and to look at the rest of New Zealand and they have absolutely no idea of the strength and the depth of what's involved out there in the gang culture these days. With the taxing that goes on, with the control that's being exerted by over smaller gangs that operate in certain areas. There's been people taken off the street who don't exist anymore. I'm aware of four or five guys from my days in the scene who no longer exist. They're just listed as missing people, but they've been taken out. The sophistication of the gangs today means it would be almost impossible to go undercover. When you look at some of the main gangs in New Zealand, they've got their own intelligence networks. They've got their own databases. They know every member of the police, in particular with the Hells Angels, you know, a very well organised group of guys, the Hells Angels Incorporated. This footage is taken from a documentary about the Hells Angels in the early 70s. It wasn't screened because it was deemed to not be in the public interest. Perhaps they had an inkling of what lay ahead. The Hells Angels would evolve into arguably the most organised criminal group in the country. It's just starting to change at that time where in America where they needed to put on a clean front, don't get involved in that rubbish on the streets, the fights and all that sort of carry on. They just left it behind them and got on with it and saw there was a more serious business to life and that was in being an incorporated society and doing other things. They're seen to be putting on a good face and try and do some, something for the community, which is great. Applaud them for that, but at the end of the day, there's more sinister activities happening in behind the scenes. We're outside the Hells Angels headquarters in Mount Eden. While it's not huge advertising, you can hardly accuse them of being covert. I've talked to the Hells Angels about ooh, four, five, six, seven to the point of annoying. I was told no. I'd been trying to get an interview with them. What I can tell you is they're affiliated with Hells Angels Incorporated, which has over 200 chapters in 27 countries. They're not as territorial as the other local gangs. They focus on developing and controlling areas of business. And increasingly, they're working with other big gangs like the Headhunters. The Headhunters have the largest territory in Auckland, being especially strong in the western suburbs. I made a number of visits to the Headhunters headquarters to persuade them to appear in this doco. Not without some trepidation, I might add, the Headhunters have a serious reputation. Finally, their leader invited us to film one of their fight nights. It was a rare invitation. The Headhunters aren't given to hosting the media. The head's main pad is a two-storey converted warehouse in Ellerslie. 
In an outside courtyard, a swimming pool was covered with planking and the boxing ring went on top, then a large marquee erected. The gym downstairs was emptied of equipment to make way for food tables and a bar. While it all appeared to be running like a well-oiled Harley, I still wanted an interview with the man regarded by the headhunters as the boss. Described as a fundraiser, tickets have to be brought up to six months ahead, proceeds go to the That Was Then, This Is Now Trust, a trust set up by the headhunters. It's taken five meetings to get this close and the boss, Wayne Doyle, while welcoming, flatly refuses to speak on camera. One standout aspect of the night was how accepted the headhunters are in the community. Look at this crowd. Local business people, boxing fans. It challenges the popular view of the kind of people who socialise with gangs. Five of the major Auckland gangs were also at fight night. This bout between a headhunter and a Hells Angel ended in a draw. Police say that amongst the highly organised gangs, there's far more interaction, and not just at social events like this one. Years ago, we would see all the gangs did their own thing and very rarely intermingled, so to speak. Now we are seeing groups uh, sharing resources to continue their drug dealing and, and drug manufacture because there's such a ready market out there for them they don't have to fight each other, um, they're working together. Groups that we've never seen working together before. You have the headhunters and the Hells Angels. We see Mongrel Mob and Black Power coming together, sharing resources. Do you think peas caused that? Yes, I do. We see the cooks um, being swapped between gangs. So they'll be cooking for one gang one week, uh, cooking for another gang the next week. And, you know, it, it's something you haven't seen in the past. After the break, the Asian syndicates and why Auckland is awash with pee. My day it wasn't quite as nasty. People were just starting to get kidnapped. There's huge amounts of cash being taken out of the New Zealand economy because of drugs and it's going to the gangs. It's not unusual to go to addresses and find food town bags full of cash that is all drug money. It's not unusual to find buried in the back garden two, three hundred thousand dollars at these addresses. The drug P has turned our major gangs into corporate entities, making millions, probably billions of dollars. It's happened in a very short space of time of 10 years, and it's happened because of Asian crime dealers hooking up with our local gangs. It will take New Zealand Customs two hours to unload this shipping container, and several more hours to open up suspicious looking cartons. Of course, drugs are on the top of the list of things to look out for. Anything with a cavity rings alarm bells. Pseudo-ephedrine, inside ornaments. How on earth would you well, detect it, that? It, you get the shape of the animal, or whatever it is, that would be green around the outside for the ceramic, and then orange in the middle, which would indicate the organic drug inside it. The X-ray revealed a box of dodgy-looking cigarette lighters. If it was empty, it's quite a decent size consignment for something to be concealed within. But because it's already got lighter fluid in it, then I'm happy that there's nothing inside that. On average, Customs makes a drug find every day. Nine times out of ten, they're finding the precursor for making pee and capsules known as Contact NT. In the last four years, Customs have found over 7.3 million capsules that would make a minimum 330 kilos of pure methamphetamine. Out on the street, its value, $330 million. 
They're also finding big stashes of bulk precursor in sachets and packets. But how much is getting through undetected? Customs, police and street sources tell me at best they're finding 30%, but it's more likely to average around 10%. They know where it's coming in, either at Auckland Airport or at the ports, but it's nigh on impossible to work out when and how. Over a million containers come through the ports of Auckland every year. It's becoming more and more difficult to identify the right containers to open. A link back to China is a good starting point. In comparison to other countries and nationalities of people, China and Chinese criminals, because that's what they are, they are criminals, are probably in the high 80% of issues that we're dealing with at the moment. 80%? Yeah. It's actually well over 80%. To give you an idea of the quantities involved in a recent case, a Chinese student was charged with running a methamphetamine smuggling operation involving 12 other Asians. He's alleged to have kept $550,000 in a safety deposit box and transferred another $1.5 million back to China over 22 months. Another ring member was found with over $90,000 cash in a paper bag. They supplied a dealer who's reported as having 30 kilos of methamphetamine. That's $30 million worth. There's been reports of Asian triads moving in and battling the local gangs for control of the drug trade. To find out more, I met with a man working inside the Asian pea industry. He was placing his life at risk by talking to me so I can't show him or reveal his voice. This contact said the drug importation began with the large numbers of Asian students who came here in the mid-90s. The Asian gangs have extensive contacts back in South China where most of the drug is purchased. The Asian gangs are not triads, they're loose organisations made up of individuals with family or cultural links. Typically, one or more Asian businessmen will fund the importation. They're recent immigrants, post-1990. Full-time importers will do a shipment every three months. The Asian groups avoid warring with the local gangs. It's bad for business. Not only do they supply the local gangs with precursors for making pee, they use them as muscle for deliveries and protection. From our point of view, we've seen the Asians become a lot more involved in the importation, but what they're doing is they're distributing through the gangs. They're all, all here, they can all commit their crime, they can all make their money, and they'll work together as necessary. Once the drugs are in the country, they're bought by either the gangs or independent syndicates to be distributed or to be turned into pee. You get your, your condenser, you're looking about $500 for condenser, Three neck, say fifteen hundred bomb, be five hundred bucks all the time. You get it machined, and that's a bit pressure cooker. Condenser, three neck, bong, tools of the pea cooking trade. We haven't mocked this up. This footage of an actual pea lab was supplied to us by an anonymous gang source. This is the final distillation of the chemicals. It will be heated until the liquid crystallizes into pea. The slower you do it, the better it comes out. Like you do it for three hours, you start getting a reasonable amount. But if you turn it right down and you do it a real slow process, you get the really perfect, good, potent, and you get everything out of it. This man was a part-time peacock, like our Asian contact who took a big risk in talking to me. Motels, do it in motel. But we only cooked in motels. Extracting was done somewhere else. Because that's, that's a smell part of it. The cooking itself, there's no smell, there's nothing. He started out cooking for himself and friends, but then did a one-off cook for a gang. It went badly wrong, and the ingredients were wasted. When somebody comes along, so you can okay, do this for me. And then you make a fuck up, and you go back and say, I only got this much for it. Here's the rest. You go, you have the rest of your life. At that point, the gang demanded he start working for them. I mean, they even turned up a couple of times to take me to go, go to work. I can turn up on the website. I said, come on, you can come out and do some work. 
The cooks are so highly valued that it's almost impossible for them to escape the control of a gang. This man paid thousands of dollars for another gang to negotiate him out of his cooking obligations. To give you an idea of how many labs are operating, the police discovered 211 drug labs in 2006, 46 of them in the Auckland region. Of the 335 people convicted, 75% of them were gang members or had a link to a gang. The motorcycle gangs, Highway 61, Headhunters and Hells Angels are the big players in the local pea industry. They built up their distribution networks in the 1980s and 90s, importing and selling hard drugs like heroin and cocaine through tinny houses and brothels. A lot of business was often done between girls and the clubs. We knew a lot of them, they knew a lot of us. 20 years of working as a prostitute, a working girl in parlours, a large part of that addicted to heroin. Stacey knows the motorcycle gangs intimately, sharing the beds of gang presidents, buying and selling drugs with them. I did a lot of dealing with them, as well as they did with me, because I knew a lot of people. At what sort of level of dealing? Large amounts, you were dealing in kilos, ounces. They had money, so like if you ended up with something on your lap that large, they were the first people you went to because they were the only ones that could pay for it. But Stacey was buying and selling drugs between gangs, earning money to support her habit. It was a dangerous game to play. It all started coming to light that I was moving from one club to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next with different drugs and I owed money and all the rest of it and um, I was waking up to different ones turning out with guns. I think the last two years I expected to die that way and I kept saying to them, like, if you're going to do it, just do it, don't threat me. Stacey got out of prostitution and dealing in the early days of pee but has a good idea of what's happening now. It's got more nastier now than it used to be. My day it wasn't quite as nasty. People were just starting to get kidnapped and um, held captive to make different substances, but these days it's, it's foul. It's a completely different world. It's got more ruthless because the stakes are so much higher. With heroin and other drugs, the gangs might have quadrupled their money. With P, they can multiply their investment 10, maybe 20 times over. After the break, how do the gangs keep their young men out of crime and out of jail? Uh, 16, I think I went in. What for? I think it's fair to say the top tier gangs, Hells Angels, Highway 61, the Headhunters, have become like corporate organisations. But in the interests of balance, there's another side to the gangs, a culture of protection for their own, the family and their immediate community. There's no doubt they're actively involved in crime. Look at the prison stats and all feature prominently. However, when I spoke to the leaders of these gangs, responsibility to Fano, Ainga and family is a big factor in how they think and operate. The Charles from a uh, motorcycle club, very family orientated, group of guys up and down the country. It's my family. No payment, all of this for me is about looking after the family, it's all. You can see this responsibility to family and people in the neighbourhood coming through in the way young people are taken into gangs. Last week we met Chopper, a prospect in the King Cobras, a gang strong in central Auckland. Well, I saw Chief and Tresma only hung them all. Yeah. So I walked up to him, hey Chief, and he's like, hey Chopper. And he asked me, you still on pee and dope and stuff? And I was like, yes, yeah, same old. And he goes, oh, just come around and see us. I'll help you out, get you off that stuff. The police say this is how the gangs recruit young men, and they're right. But at the same time, there is a genuine concern amongst some gangs about how pee is impacting on their young members. We do our best to keep P away from ourselves because it's a headache. The loyalty to the colours becomes a question. It's the same reason why they don't have heroin, and P fits into that category. For gangs like the KCs to have a future, they have to retain their existing members and find ways of attracting new members. 
Most of the established gangs are relatively stable in number. A few are decreasing. Only the mongrel mob and black power are growing significantly. The mob are believed to have around 1,200 patched members. The black power, slightly less. You know, most of the kids, they come over, you know. They're coming over because, you know, maybe, you know, maybe things are not going right at home. You know, and I sit there and talk with them, you know, and it's better here than under the bridge or somewhere else. Loco is a patched King Cobra. He comes from a troubled past, but he's an example of a young man finding something in the gang culture that appeals. The hook that caught Loco was music. I was asked the question, Loco, what do you want to do in the next five years? And, oh, I really like my music and I want to pursue that. Yes, okay, you focus on that. That's what you solely focus on. That was three years ago. Today he's recording a song with producer Chong Ni. Its message is anti-violence. However, many of Loco's songs reflect his early years of drugs, crime and jail before he became a KC. How long were you in jail? Two years, not that long. From what age? Uh, 16, I think I went in. Yeah. What for? 16, um, GBH, chucking someone in the boot and biting his face off. And... It was a grotesque act of violence fueled by a drug spender with his girlfriend. 36 hour stint of just drinking and smoking and dropping mushrooms and everything. Then a third person came into the mix. Uh, the poor fella ended up in the boot. So, um, yeah, he'd said the wrong word at the wrong time and I wasn't in a very happy place and he ended up in the boot. So. Did I hear you correctly biting someone's face off? Um, yeah, I can't rem remember actually doing it, but my co-offender saw me do it. It was one of those blank out stages and plus I was pretty intoxicated so I don't really know what I was doing at the time. Incredibly the man survived. Loco served his time and has since made his peace with his victim. Two songs charted off an album Loco released last year. I actually feel a lot more free now. I mean, I'm getting all this pain and hurt out through the music. So that's left room for me to feel good about things now. Today he's putting down the final tracks on the anti-violence song. He's collaborating with an overseas gangster rapper, Monster Gunja. The music industry is just one area of straight business the gangs are moving into. Another gang has contracts with the local council for maintaining streets and parks, and the mongrel mob notorious chapter run building and security company Rent-A-Bro. Of course, enterprises like these can be a front for illegal activity, but they also enable a gang to retain members who don't want to do crime, and they help to keep members out of jail. Just say there's five members in the clip. One's a builder, one's a musician, the other three are blah, blah. That's good, because none of them are going to jail. We want to get out of that thinking that you have to do crime to make a dollar and because you've come from poverty, that's part and parcel. We, we want to show different. You don't have to follow this path. I mean, your choice is your choice, but now we've got other paths that we didn't have before. After the break, mayhem on the streets. Well, just look at us, we, you know we do crime. Um, we do all sorts of crimes from pharmaceuticals, Put it down on this standovers. Shit. 2003, Otahu, 16 year old Jordan Adams repeatedly beaten around the head. October 2005, Otara, Ulio Naia, stabbed and beaten. 2006, Otahu, 24 year old Fafatai Lafalua. 
deliberately run over. September 2006, Otara, 17-year-old Ricky Murphy bludgeoned with a baseball bat. In the last three years, 10 young men have died in Auckland in conflict linked to youth gangs, eight of those in South Auckland. There's a corridor of youth gang activity cutting through South Auckland, starting in Counties Manukau, through Otahuhu, Onehanga, and then into Mount Albert and Mount Roskill. Mount Roskill is on the fringe of Auckland's CBD. There's a large Maori and Polynesian community here, large families, not a lot of money, frequent cases of violence at home. It's a stereotype, but unfortunately, an accurate one. Kids like these are ripe for recruitment into any one of a number of local youth gangs. I spent several nights on the streets with two of the largest and most dangerous youth gangs in Auckland. These guys belong to the Crips, the Crips DMS. Catchy we acronym. No money sex, you know? Yeah. There's another with the money stealing crip gang up in here, you know? We're still caught up in the whip, eh? The money stealing crip gang, number around 50, mostly Tongan, aged between 15 and 25, which makes them a youth gang. You know, like youth gangs is different than gangs, like, you know, jealousy. Cobras. Black powers, you know, we're different from them. We're youth gangs, you know, we terrorize the streets. In some ways, calling them youth gangs is a misnomer, Pam, because uh, the vast majority of the people that we're finding engaging in this street gang activity are over the age of 18 years. But many of them are 14. I've met them. Yes, yeah, some are, yeah. Yeah. My parents raised me good, but you know, it's the way of life. The way you're brought up, this neighbourhood, we're all friends since a young age. So we're going to grow up together. We're not just mates, we're all like family here. The youth gangs here are heavily influenced by what's happening in the States. Straight Crip and DMS set tripping. Oh. Take the Crips. Their name comes from an LA gang. City of Crips, not City of Sales. It's not just the names they borrow. Central. The gestures and the language are straight off the LA streets. Two C's, free locker, free C set, free C door. Back for the Crips. Do Crip and DMS. Do more my homies. With alcohol on board, the gang mentality gathers momentum. Young males out to prove themselves or to establish status in the gang. This guy claimed he was one of the leaders and mouthed threats at us most of the night. And you gonna get fucked with this is the way it is. You get fucked up when you fuck with us. Yeah. We keep a fucking two C set your crib all day. I didn't even understand that. Was that English? Yeah, I'll tell you again. I said we keep it 2C set to crib all day. Fuck Every up. day. Don't fuck around. OK. <laughs> I think that um, that got through. Later, he kicks the lens of the camera. And then he throws a full can at our cameraman. It's all petty sort of stuff, but if you believe what they told us, there's far more serious crime going on. We do runners, we do egg rolls, we do fucking burglaries, we do everything. Yeah, but we, we, still, we do standovers on dope, we do everything, we steal money, you know? When you say you do all those things, I mean, is there any law you wouldn't break? We well, break that law. Rules are meant to be broken, you know? We do everything, you know? Tell me more. <laughs> Tell you more? Yeah. Well, you need to come for like a documentary no. for a week or less. You'll see people going getting locked up when you know on camera. No, no, see, no. So, are we talking like murder? Murder. No, we we'll murder. We'll, we haven't done murder yet. But we'll, we'll do murder where it comes down to it. You know, if someone comes does something to us we don't like, you know, we retaliate and we retaliate with you know anger, you know, anger shit. This especially applies to their rival gang, the Bloods. No nigga gonna come up in red to this area and like walk around like if we see a nigga in red and they're like walking like, you know, think they're bad and all, you know, fuck, we straight run them over, bro. 
You know, we don't like red around this area. Red is straight dead in this area. There's groups of bloods all over the country. These guys are based in Mungary. We met them at a charming little spot. I asked them why they weren't with some of the other bigger gangs. We got a lot of them. We got KCs in Mangri, we got um, Black Power, Mongrel Mob. Do you have any desire to join them? No, not at all. I hate them. You hate them? Yep, I hate why? them. This is our gang right here. This is our gang right here, Bloods. Why must there be hate, like with the, the Crips? Why must there be hate? Because they look at life differently compared to us. <laughs> While I couldn't see much of a difference between them, there's little doubt these youth gangs carry out their threats of violence against one another. Last year, the Crips attacked a gang called the JDKs with all manner of weapons, including machetes. When do you party? <laughs> hey, settle, fella. Uh, have you used one of those? We've used it too many times. The JDKs, you know about us. You know, you know, nigga. You know, I see like you don't know. Money, nigga. Uh, you got Play your fun. hand chopped off, yo. Uh, straight seize the fuck. Tell, you know, tell me what, what what are you doing with the machetes? We're doing with machetes. We gangbang with machetes. Have you? You want us to go and get guns and come back? No. Have you got? Have you, have you got guns? We got guns. We all run with guns. How hard is it to get a gun? How hard is it? Just like that. Okay. There's a lot of bravado happening, and the camera was an added incentive. But remember, in the last three years, there have been eight deaths in South Auckland connected to the youth gangs. A number of those were a little more than, you could almost call them accidents, when two groups get together, uh, highly intoxicated, end up in a fight, and unfortunately, in the heat of the moment, you know, people were killed. Local cop Jason Hewitt believes it's not as bad as the media make out. For a start, he says, the numbers are all wrong. Outrageous figures are being put out there, thousands and thousands of gang members across the streets of South Auckland. I think that's fundamentally incorrect. I think if we look at how many of them are actually involved in uh, serious or even minor criminal activity, that number is, is a lot um, smaller. When the killing started, police tried to gauge the scale of the problem. They counted the street gangs and the number of people in them. People we tried to count were certainly calling themselves a gang name, certainly wearing a gang colour and really mimicking that whole hip-hop gangster rap kind of scene. Bloods, Crips. But that's all it was, it was copycatting and, and mimicking. And when we look back at the people that we incorporated into our first list, many of them haven't come to any form of police attention uh, and probably never will. Jason Hewitt believes the youth gang problem has been overhyped by the media, and he may well be correct. Young men doing crime on our street isn't exactly a new phenomenon. The Yogi Bears are one of the new generation of teenage gangs in Auckland. 25 years ago, when there weren't cell phones or violent video games, these guys were a street gang in South Auckland. Their interests include hanging out on the streets, playing video games, drinking beer, and the burglaries they're keen to talk about. Once we run out of money, we need money. Well, that's the only thing to do. Rob the rich and feed the poor. It just happens. Uh, we do all sorts of crimes from pharmaceuticals, Put it down on standovers. Shit. It just shows that some things don't change. Rebellious young males are always going to travel in a pack. It's just that there are so many of them doing it now with a lot more anger and a lot more firepower. And if you look at the population trends for South Auckland, it's likely to get worse. Projections for 10 to 20 years from now paint a grim picture. The Polynesian and Maori communities where gangs have a strong foothold will be even larger and there'll be more cases of poverty, child abuse and domestic violence, all key ingredients in pushing a boy towards a gang life. After the break, is there a solution to the gang problem? How do you think it would help you in making decisions um, whether or not to join a gang? Will the tribesmen last forever? Forever, Pam. How can you say that with certainty? Because I believe in it.
probably going to be someone sitting here talking about organised criminals. No matter what there is, there will be gangs and there will be organised criminals. I don't think they'll go away. They might change to adapt, but the roots are there. They're family orientated. It's just like saying you losing your family membership and taking your name away. You'll never do it. It's there for life. You'd expect gang members to say that, but can we ever hope to be rid of them? In the last year, various politicians have called for banning patches, boot camps and doubling jail sentences for offenders with gang affiliations. It's cloud nine material. Never get rid of gangs. There's always that percentage of society uh, go back to Robin Hood who will rebel and who will do their own thing. It's just a matter of how it's controlled. Would you describe the organised crime unit as being on top of it, ahead of it, behind? You could probably never have enough people dealing with it. There will always be some level of organised groups out there that will be trying to do something. Would it be fair to say keeping a lid on it or what? Yeah. A lot of the things we do, as much as prosecute, is to disrupt what they're doing, to, to try and disrupt the supply chains and, and everything else. The police seem more confident about the youth gang problem. I am absolutely convinced the problem is decreasing. When I think back to uh, when the problem was at its most acute in late 2005 and early 2006, police were responding to numerous conflicts, numerous um, gang-related fights. Um, we're just not responding to that level now. But Jason Hewitt's optimism about the youth gangs isn't shared by the established gangs. They clearly see them as a big problem. For a start, the youth don't play by the old rules. At the end of the day, you've got to have some rules. You don't touch family houses. You don't touch old people. You don't touch people that are going about their business. Some of these groups, anyone in front of them, they're just going to give them a knock because that's, that's the way they are. It's got out of hand. We thought it might have died down, or, but it's, it's gotten bigger. So it really is a, a bugger of a problem, isn't it? It's big. Big as in the amount of kids that are drawn to it for the sole reason that it's, they can set up a gang tomorrow, name it after their street. And you've got 10, 15 kids on the street and then from various other streets. 20, 30 of you are drinking at the park. There you are, you've got your crew. And you only need a couple of hard fellas in there to do some vicious things, then you've got yourself a name. Last year I got shot. My bro got shot, half his face got blown away. A hui was held in South Auckland late last year to discuss the problem of youth gangs. It attracted members from most of the established gangs. This is the reason why we have to help the youth. We're all connected. And you don't have to be like us. Violence is not the answer to everything. It takes a man to walk away. What I see happening here is a movement. You people are creating a movement. But is it enough of a movement? I respect what these people are trying to do, but it still looks a bit like window dressing. And it smacks of hypocrisy. Gang members advising the youth not to do crime while they remain affiliated with a criminal organisation. The whole issue of youth gangs needs a concerted rethink, not rhetoric or bumper sticker solutions. You can't build more jails. I mean, we've got 20 or so already. If you're going to keep going down that road, you're going down the wrong road. You need to catch them in that age group, 13, 14, 15, and give them some tools or, or um, education that they can relate to. Getting to the kids before they get involved with gang activity is so screamingly obvious. The British Treasury came up with this idea many years ago, claiming it was the most cost-effective way of dealing with gangs in the UK. But we have been so slow to take it up. How big is, say, the potential to get into a criminal life or a gang life in an area like this? The potential is quite big. Around here, it's particularly the Bloods and the Crips, for example. I've had a child who flatly refused to 
I was trying to give him a hoop, just in a PE lesson, and he would not take, I think it was a blue hoop, because he wanted a red one. He would not have the blue hoop at all. These aren't secondary school kids Felicity Oberlin Brown is talking about. Some are as young as eight or nine. Felicity is principal at Randwick Park Primary School in Manarewa. Yes, Randwick Park, the area where bottle store owner Navtej Singh was recently killed by a group of young men. Three men, one of them armed with a rifle, entered this liquor store at nine last night. What started as a robbery soon went horribly wrong. So who can tell us what the rules are in our school? Randwick Park Primary is the only school in the country to practice a relatively new approach to juvenile crime and seduction into gangs. When you're outside of school, have you had people talk to you about gangs? Yes. Yeah. Do you see gangs around out in the... Yes. It's a big yes. Yeah. Sometimes they bully you. This is an RTP class, RTP being the Responsible Thinking Programme. Sometimes they bully you about the colours you wear. What sort of bullying over the colours? Like, they'll just like hit you, and try and take it off you and that. And say if you're wearing blue by accident, I mean... Yeah, they'll probably try and take it off you, or you just give it to you. The aim is to make the kids aware that there are serious consequences if they do bad things. Yeah. Why do you think responsibility is really important? Because little kids look up to you. Yeah. Some of them, if they've damaged property, they may be put on what we call community service, which is outside sweeping paths and, and caring for the community. You know, you break the rules, you take the consequences. So if you're using the responsible thinking process, how do you think it would help you in making decisions um, whether or not to join a gang? Thinking about the consequences you're going to get to do stuff you don't want to. What we're trying to do is give children the ability to make a decision for themselves about what they actually want to do. Do they want to go down that gang path or do they want to go to college and then go on to university? And some children have come back from a local college and you'll say to them, oh, how's it going? And they say, really good, I want to go to university, miss. And you say, wow. And you think back a few years and you think, I would never have thought he would say that. You know, I would have thought that this child would be heading down the wrong path. A lot of people, because I've been doing this program on gangs, they think gangs are glamorous, you know, cool. And does any of it look like fun that they're having? Yeah. must be incredibly hard for some children because the influences at home and on the TV and in the music, all around them, those influences are actually there. And they have to be very strong to actually not go down that path. Randwick is a decile one school. They spend $65,000 out of their limited budget per year to run the program. They've applied for government funding at least three times and been turned down every time, but they've stuck with it because it's producing results. What I'd like to know is amidst all this talk of spending money on boot camps and putting police into schools, why isn't the RTP scheme more widely supported? So there you have it, the last 18 months of my life. I haven't gone soft after all my time spent with gangsters. I worried that I would. It was gang members who told me not to trust them. But having observed how the underworld thinks and operates, I believe there's little we can do about the established gangs apart from keeping a lid on them, like the coppers say. Our best hope is to keep our kids out of gangs and out of crime. I shed a tear for the children who were brought up to hate I shed a tear for the fear of growing closer to death I shed a tear till there was none left behind closed doors Nobody knows what happens behind closed doors Baby, my life is like a mirror of yours Pain I was forced to face is like a fake wrist in death I shed a tear till there was none left behind closed doors Nobody knows what happens